everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Andrea and today I'd like to try something a little different. I feel like lately I've put all of these strict borders and categories to my reading life and I'm very particular about putting certain videos and certain playlists and that mentality has kept me from actually sharing my reading experiences which is kind of sad and now I think I need to catch up a little bit on wrapping up what I've read and just talking about these books that I've enjoyed so much. Reading is kind of a process or a journey and when you read more books at once it really takes a long time to finish them all. I've had a lot of thoughts and feelings lately and I'd like to kind of discuss that with you and I want this to feel like a cozy hangout, like you're, you're hanging out with a friend and you're just talking. So at the very beginning of quarantine I made a lot of videos. I was on the go. I wanted to get so much of my experience from before out there because I had a feeling that we were gonna be in quarantine for a while. And I'm really happy I made those. I made like how to nerd out, what to do, and some suggestions. But at the time, it had just started. So all of the things I recommended weren't things that I was actually doing during quarantine yet, because it hadn't officially been more than like five days. So now I actually get to check in 40 days deep into quarantine. So first off, I have, a pin in the wheel of time i talked to joe and together we kind of agreed that the wheel of time requires focus only on the wheel of time and we're just not really in the mood to give all of our time to wheel of time i think if you if you really want to go that route you just have to focus on that series and that series only and by the time you get far enough into the series, you kind of want to start over because you forgot some parts. So we've been just kind of stuck in this loop of pausing and forgetting, so we just decided to stop. If you are interested in Wheel of Time stuff, I will link some channels down below that review it in a wonderful way and to, to engage with the TV show and everything but it's just not going to come from this channel anymore. And the other thing I decided to stop is my nerding out series. It's been a year of nerding out and the reason I started it in the first place was because a long time ago I found myself in a place where I didn't know what people did with their time or life and I wish that someone out there would show me like what they do on their personal private time and that if they're more calm and nerdy they're okay too you don't need to go on a roller coaster ride or travel to places far across the sea to have a good time and that life is made up of beautiful little moments and little opportunities and a lot of them could be free if you go to the library or the museum and I really wanted to kind of show that and to show that there are learning opportunities everywhere all the time but they did kind of start to get a bit too academic and that's my fault I was upset with myself because I have this inner critic that constantly says who gave you the right i think i mentioned this in my reading history video when i talked about my like whole history of reading personally and how even to get started on writing a blog about books i felt like i had to have my librarianship master's degree in hand so that if someone says to you like well who gave you the right to talk about books then i could be like well the university of toronto of course and lately, every time I get interested in a topic, even so small, my first instinct is to get certified and to find a course. I do love learning, okay? I will learn for free all the time and I love searching for answers, but I think my approach has been a little bit too much towards the certified courses direction and it's kind of worrying. I mean, not only are they not free, it's also kind of like once I get into it, it starts to have that academia feel. And it's a part of academia that I didn't enjoy. The part that kind of ruins the fun of learning. Um, I've always hated that part of academia. I was always so interested in learning about things, but I wanted to be applicable in a way that's you know, this is what happened, this is why we need to know about it, this is how other people feel about it, this is some discussion that's been going on. Um, how do you feel? Kind of engaging with the content on a personal level. And instead, things get so distant and so structured that for me, it's just been kind of soul-sucking and it's made me hate so much about certain kinds of books in the past. 
um, and I just don't want my learning experience outside of school to somehow turn into that again. So how this little transition happened was while being in the self-isolating period, I realized that I wanted to give myself space to learn and grow and just kind of allow myself to enjoy my time. And that's exactly what I've done. And I have been loving self-isolation. And I haven't made videos because I was just kind of being me by myself and enjoying it. I have posted a lot of photos on Instagram, but for the most part, I have been either in my apartment or on nature walks. And I allowed myself to just have fun with whatever I felt was worth doing. And what I ended up doing was painting. I started painting a lot and I started going on a lot of nature walks. And oh, it was so beautiful. A lot of the violets have come out and um, just the trees and the green, the mossy kind of bits. And it's fun picking out nature in the middle of a city to walk among skyscrapers and to zoom in on that flower, you know? Um, so like for me personally, it's been like a journey to walk through Toronto and just find the grassy patches and those little corners of nature that are kind of like hiding or just resisting it all. And I do have a few parks nearby that I go visit often. I did do a little bit of a spring nature haul. I really enjoy kind of pressing leaves and collecting flowers and little bits of like acorns and pine cones. So that has been a lot of fun. I can't emphasize how much I've enjoyed this part of my self-isolation time period. And indoors, I have been reading and painting and doing little crafty projects and cleaning little corners of my apartment all the time. There's always something to clean for some reason. But just a little side note on this nature walks. I discovered two apps um, recently that have brought me so much joy. So one of them is called PlantNet where you can have it on your phone and if you just take a picture of the plant that you're looking at the app will find what name that plant has like its latin name its everyday usage and whether or not it's poisonous and it will find other pictures of that same plant just to verify with you that it's the same thing um, i really love that app it's free and um, it really helps, especially if you're like foraging and you're thinking of eating some of this stuff. It's probably best to know what they are. The second app is called iNaturalist and it's kind of like a grown-up naturalism Pokemon game for adults, but it's not really a game. It's kind of the same deal as the first app where you can take photos of nature around you, but you just upload it to your phone and it will go to this worldwide environmental database and it will pin the location where this herb or plant grows. So in a weird way you're contributing to a larger thing as well as kind of finding and scouting plants and mushrooms and birds. So it's been um, really cool to play around with those two apps. And another app I've been playing with in my apartment while organizing things has been um, this closet app where I cataloged all of my clothing by taking like I hung them up on this hook and I would take pictures of individual clothing and I would just kind of catalog it in this app based on what it was. Obviously Cthulhu gave me some trouble because that's what he does. Overall really cool experience. Um, I'm also polishing some rocks at the moment. I have one of those rock tumblers that I borrowed from someone and they're just tumbling away but they're very noisy. I honestly thought I would be more involved in the process but it's just a little machine that tumbles rocks and you just wait for 48 hours until they're all polished. But my, my plan is to make some jewelry out of those stones and to see what comes out. Uh, I can't wait to open it. Uh, in terms of like pure escapism, I have been alternating between watching The Office and Black Sails. For those of you who don't know, Black Sails was a show that aired for four seasons and it ended in 2017. And it's very 
piratey. It is a prequel to Treasure Island. So there's a lot of pirates and we get to see young Silver and how he comes across like maps and coordinates and it's such a good show. I've been loving it so much. But just be warned, it is a little bit like on a scale of 1 to Game of Thrones, the violence to boob ratio it's at an 8. So like, you know, beware if you're not okay with that kind of content. Also, one of the executive producers is Michael Bay. So there's a lot of ships just kind of, you know, blowing up. So let's talk about the books. The first book that I've been enjoying so much in self-isolation has been the annotated Hans Christian Andersen book. I have it here. This uh, book, like many annotated series, is annotated by Maria Tatar. And she is one of the most wonderful people that I've ever met. She's a Harvard professor and she just loves fairy tales in general. And she's written several books on it. I just love her work. And I wanted to give myself permission to take my time with this. And I wasn't sure how I was going to do it at first. But Paul, uh, from Paul Weymouth, um, I'll link his channel down below, has sent me a free credit on Libro.fm, which was the audiobook uh, subscription I told you about um, in terms of supporting local bookstores. And he kindly gifted a bunch of his bookish friends some credits. And with it, I purchased 15 hours worth of Hans Christian Andersen fairy tales. So what I did is I would follow along in the text and listen to the audio of a story. And as soon as the story finished, I would pause it. And then I would go back and read all of the annotated parts that Maria Tatar inserted there. And the cool thing about this is that she does a lot of comparative mythology and she's very well versed in fairy tales. She studied Germanic languages. She was the head of the folklore and mythology department at Harvard for a while. And she's very skilled when it comes to picking out elements from each one of the other cultures and what might have influenced Anderson or what he in turn later influenced and it just it makes your mind go like because you just constantly think of all of the stories you've heard before and it like collects it all in one um, I just love the reading experience and I will say that because this is annotated it doesn't have all of the fairy tales so it's not a complete Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale um, collection but the audiobook did have the complete so whenever there was a new fairy tale that wasn't in here some that I've never heard before like Big Hans and Little Hans um, I would just kind of make note in my notebook and just keep it kind of to myself and just you know make notes I've just been amazed with how much I've missed as both a child and later on when I read it in parts for one there were some fairy tales that I wasn't expecting to be so Christian. I don't know why this took me by surprise. So I was first introduced to The Little Mermaid, for example, by Disney, like most people. And then you have those kind of voices from the internet that are like, well, fairy tales are a lot darker than you expect and childhood ruined. But The Little Mermaid, for the most part, has been pretty well adapted. The more I thought about it as I was reading, a lot of things lined up with what Disney ended up doing with the film. But what they kind of missed out, which was a very important element, was why Ariel wanted to become, or The Little Mermaid, because she doesn't have her name here, why she wanted to become human. And there's this passage in here where she sort of discusses with someone that you know, mer people, when they die, they just become part of the sea foam and the sea kelp. But when humans die, their souls is eternal and it rises up to heaven with celestial beings and it becomes holy and heavenly. And she yearns for her soul to be like the human soul because she doesn't want to just become a part of the sea foam. And that element really changes her intentions in my opinion it i feel like a big criticism of the little mermaid in general has been wow like you'll give up your voice and your family for a man but in the original story 
the fact that she had this like almost spiritual aspiration um, kind of threw me off a little bit. So this kind of ends on a similar note to how James Matthew Barry represents fairies as kind of being born out of a child's laughter. Hence Christian Anderson takes this turn here with The Little Mermaid saying, For every day we find a good child who makes his parents happy and deserves their love, God shortens the time of the trial of the mermaids that they go into if they, they are on trial, which Ariel is for her exchange. And children never know when we are going to fly into their rooms and if we smile with joy when we see the child then a year is taken away from the 300 but a mean or naughty child makes us shed tears of sorrow and each of these tears adds another day to our time of trial there were some stories in here that were just so devastating like the story of a mother and death acceptance in that one then there was also the red shoes which is terrifying um the shadow was less terrifying than i remember it now i love this experience of like listening and reading so much that as i was reading through this i made a painting with all of these like um elements like the little ugly duckling and thumbelina and the snow queen which is honestly like one of the coolest ever and the wild swans up here and the goblin and in the middle is like Hans Christian Andersen's silhouette and the pea from the princess and the pea and the red shoes I framed it because I really I really like this painting and I wanna I wanna put it up somewhere in the apartment it was just so much fun working on this because I haven't painted in a really long time and it's something I'd like to carry on with because I really enjoy it. Going on the sort of Scandinavian Nordic project path, earlier in the year I read this book called Hunger by Nut Hamsun. There's a lot of it that reminds me of Dostoevsky's Poor Folk or this kind of, I don't want to say romanticized idea of poverty, but there's something very simple and peasant-ish about it um, in a way that's also kind of devastating, but in a well-written tragic story kind of way so we follow along an author and he is losing his job but everyone's losing their jobs it's a very similar time to now or the great depression where people are just struggling he hopes at the beginning he's very hopeful and he has this vision for how he's going to write certain things and how he's going to publish some articles and do well but as we have seen in this time of panic really and hunger and job layoffs the first things to go are usually the arts because we're going back to survival mode obviously he loses his job very fast and as he has less and less resources like no more food um, you kind of start to see the breakdown of the human spirit that only p poverty has the power to do because this man is educated and he's very self-aware but at the same time despite his resilience poverty breaks him down you see how slowly he starts to gnaw on like bones and alleyways because he's just so hungry his visions of writing go right out the window because he can't have the energy to write anymore he's just sleeping a lot and falls into a kind of depression and his ability to be creative fades his ability to be a journalist goes away like he doesn't have the capacity he slowly tears down the pillars of humanity in him but there are moments where you kind of feel like despite all of it he still knows that he's a human being and therefore he deserves to be loved and cared for he sort of begins a love affair with this woman um, I, I say love affair, like he's not having an affair, he's not married, he's a bachelor, but um, he starts this like passionate relationship with this woman who honestly says, you know, I love you be even if you're poor, like I don't care, but there's a lot that's complicated about their relationship, but to see him pursuing it, despite the fact that he knows he has nothing physical to offer her aside from himself, um, is, is a sign of like great integrity and self-confidence because you know that despite everything we've seen on the back end he hasn't been fully broken down by poverty and uh, it kind of ends on like a hopeful note 
And you also get to see scenes of like town and how other people in society deal with the same issues or how sometimes they put each other down while at other times they stand up for each other. Um, it was a very interesting book and I'm actually curious to know how or in what context this book has been taught, particularly in Norway, because this is a Norwegian book. And I loved his writing so much that I eventually went to get Growth of the Soil. This is just a book I happened to come across in the bookstore. Now, I will be honest with you, I'm not that far along. I'm at page 52. And so far, it's about a man who loves to live in the mountains. And at first, he's just kind of okay being alone. But then he gets a wife and she loves being with him. And they have this world that they build together. You know, they get a cow, they get more goats, they build more things. She starts to have children. Um, they kind of like grow their little farm to read about nature and how they interact with the elements and um, little airs of mythology and fairy tales. I really love it But it took a very dark turn very fast because his wife has this weird hobby of liking to give birth alone So she will only do it when he leaves which I think is a little bit unrealistic if you've ever been around someone who has had a child you'll know that it's quite quite the process and no woman would want to be alone in that um, or without any help whatsoever. It's a very difficult procedure and also the way this woman is written, I just can't tell yet if it comes from a place of not knowing from the author where he just doesn't know that women don't do things like this or if he's trying to tell us something about her as a character um, and what that's supposed to mean later on and one of the shocking things that happens and I again I'm at the beginning of the book so this is not much of a spoiler but we have all of these like pleasant descriptions of nature and everything and as soon as she gives birth to a baby girl she kills it the book carries on with like nature and birds and stuff and I had to read that passage like four times like what what just happened why are we just skipping over it in one paragraph? And she just pretends like it never happened. I don't know if this is gonna have huge consequences. I don't know if, like, I don't know what's going, but that moment made me put down this book for a really long time and I didn't pick it up. And I really wanna finish it and give it the time it deserves because it's so well written. Um, Newt Kamsun, if you don't know, has won the Nobel Prize in Literature. He's from Norway, he's amazing. I really enjoy his writings. More on this later, I guess. Another book I read that was very short was The Sound of a Snail Eating, and it follows a woman. This is a memoir of sorts, it's very short. She is sick and bedridden, and she can't go anywhere, can't do anything. She feels paralyzed and powerless. And her friend brings her some flowers and some plants in a pot, and one day her friend just jokingly brings her a snail. As she's sitting there on her bed, she just stares at the snail for a really long time and watches what it does, and how it eats, and how it moves around the little terrarium that she eventually builds. Spending time with the snail makes her really interested in snails and their history, and then she takes you through a science lesson on snails, and she watches documentaries on snails and just really connects to this one snail and how his slow moving days just keep her going and how she enjoys just knowing he exists and his life is going just as slowly as hers is. Um, really cute. Um, I enjoyed it. It's again very short. I then started reading The Story That Cannot Be Told. This is a children's book or a YA book. And it's set in Romania and it follows this young girl by the name of Ilana and she is named after a very famous fairy tale and uh, she has this wild imagination. She collects stories, she writes stories, but it's also set at the time of communism and formerly socialist Romania used to be kind of very tough on censorship and on what people can write or say. A lot of people were very very suspicious about a lot of things. Now I will say the author has so far done an incredible job on collecting anecdotes. I think if you are to speak to any 
grown Romanian person. You will receive so many voices that reflect a lot of the little tidbits that the author has inserted in this book. And the author is not Romanian. I heard familiar voices in here. Uh, there's something about the time period that Romania was under Ceausescu's rule that um, is very confusing and you get a lot of conflicting opinions. On one hand, everyone had a job and on one hand, Romania was thriving on the resources that it had within its own country without outsourcing anything. But on the opposite hand, there was a lot of crackdown on controlling women's bodies. Women had to have four children. There was a lot of conflict around um, you know, censorship, like I mentioned, people mysteriously vanishing, and I think it ultimately made everyone very, very suspicious all the time. There's a lot of, like, paranoia, and that reflects so well in this book because of Ilana's parents, and Ilana's parents being so scared about certain things send Ilana away to her grandparents house in the mountains which is exactly what happened to me and I love it. So far I am maybe a quarter of the way through and I love everything about this but I cannot tell how children or adults from not Romania would engage with this book. Like I'm actually curious um, what other people would pick out from it because for me it's one of those like hey I know that or I know that fairy tale and I know those things and I'm curious how Romanians from Romania would perceive this from the older generations would they feel like the time period was captured correctly would they feel like it's too negative too positive how people would react to this book I'm really curious I would like to know I initially bought this for my 11 year old sister and again, I'm picking out all of the things that are very, very familiar. So reading through this book, I got really invested in learning more about Romania's mysterious and uncanny happenings. And I found these really cool videos exploring some caves in Romania's um, valleys. It's Luana's land is called. And Luana is this sort of mythological goddess who comes to earth to like help humans but accidentally falls in love with a peasant and ends up staying. In this region there's all these caves with mysterious writings and these rocks that grow over time and if cut these rocks resemble uh, trees and they have the circles of growth inside of them. Honestly it's just sent me on such an adventure just learning more about Romania's wildlife as well. Uh, there's a Netflix documentary called Untamed Romania, and I've watched that with so much love and passion. Um, cannot recommend all of those things enough. I will link all the things I've mentioned down below because um, I hope you would enjoy it too. And speaking of the natural realm, in the spirit of Beltane, I started reading The Green Man um, anthology, um, Tales from the Mythic Forest, and this is an anthologized collection that's only online. It hasn't been printed but it incorporates poems and short stories by Neil Gaiman and Charles DeLint and Jane Yolen and they're a mishmash of like various forms of writing and they all kind of give a nod to the green man and uh, the earth and just kind of that springy green feel. Um, really enjoy that collection. And then I've been kind of carrying on with these two books. So these are kind of like Andrea's darker side a little bit. Tales by Arthur Machen, The Great God Pan, and other horror stories. His stories are written with this very academic voice. He has so much authority. Like while you're reading, you kind of feel like you're put in your place and almost controlled by his words alone without even paying attention to how he is saying it. He has this mastery over the English language where he can spin words in such a delicate and an intense way. Um, I just, I find his writing to be mesmerizing and I'm just, I really love the stories, but I'm going through them slowly because they are horror and I'd like to kind of pace myself with that. So, um, really enjoying this. I will potentially review this in October. And then the last book that I've been reading is The Undiscovered Country, Journeys Among the Dead. So this is a death shelf book. It is very Anglo-centric and when I say Anglo I mean like 
England and maybe some of the surrounding areas. I'm just gonna read the back. In this vivid history of the macabre, Carl Watkins goes in search of the ancient customs, local characters, and compelling tales that illuminate how people over the years have come to terms with the our ultimate fate. The result is an enthralling journey into Britain's past, from medieval hauntings on the Yorkshire moors and eccentric memorials on the Cornish coast to seances in Victorian kitchens and so on. So it's anecdotal. <laughs> very much reminds me of lore, but it also kind of blends in well with the sort of death shelf and death culture and things like that. So that's kind of all I've been up to in the last month. And again, really enjoying my time. Um, I'm having a great time. Please check in. I'm sorry if this video is super long. Um, I hope you enjoyed our hangout and I will talk to you in my next video. Bye!